Well, welcome everyone. Happy Monday Fun Day. And we are ready for another instance of wine trivia. Uh, today we got a great um, topic for you that Peter Marks, uh, my colleague, put together. Um, it's all around, what's it all around, Peter? It's all it's about what? harvest. Harvest, yeah. It's October, so it's, why not? Exactly. So we have some tricky questions. I, I had an advanced look at the, the deck. There's some tricky questions in there. So I know all of our viewers love those, those tougher, uh, tougher questions. And um, I am reminded that we have some of the smartest uh, wine geeks out there uh, on Facebook who join us uh, every Monday. So welcome back and thanks so much. Why don't we go ahead and get started? I'll pull up the uh, trivia deck here. Yeah, and, sure. You know, and the reason I thought about doing harvest today is simply because, you know, we've been waking up here in Napa Valley to some beautiful, cool mornings. It gets down in the mid to high 40s or certainly low 50s. And then at daytime, it's been nice and warm. Well, today's the first day where I actually had to turn on the heat. <laughs> it's it's getting kind of cold. So harvest is probably pretty much over in, in the Napa, Northern California environment. So I thought, let's review and have some trivia. That's great. That's great. Isn't it funny? Us Northern Californians, we turn on the heat when it gets to about 60, 60 degrees and, and we put right. on our vests and... <laughs> That's right. Little booties and wool socks. Exactly. <laughs> well, before we get started, I do want to say um, hello to everyone. Uh, looks like we have a couple of people joining us from Italy, um, Hungary, South Africa, Palm Springs. So thanks so much for sharing where you're joining us from. It's always great to see um, people, familiar faces coming back as well. So welcome to you all. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to uh, pull up the the deck for you, Peter. Great, and button up as you, while you're while you're at it there. Christian. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. So the first question of the day is, and I'm not seeing that, Christian. If you're pulling it up, yeah, it's up. The, the which okay. which of these statements? So which of these statements is true? As grapes ripen, acids levels fall and sugars rise as grapes ripen acid levels rise and sugars rise as grape ripens acid levels fall and sugars fall or as grapes ripen acid levels rise and sugars fall so everyone's rising and falling and <laughs> doing all sorts of things here so is it correct a b c or d okay yeah for you regulars who are with us every Monday, you know that the Jeopardy music plays, allows you to lock in, in that answer. I uh, see some answers mm -hmm. coming in right now. Um, when the music stops, we will reveal uh, the correct answer. Yeah, I see a lot of A's coming through. I think uh, we do have the A team here for sure. <laughs> okay, and the music right. stopped, and it looks like, well, you can see the there, answer Peter. Is Indeed, the correct answer is A. So as grapes ripen, acid levels fall, and the sugars rise. And obviously, the winemaker or the vintner's uh, choice of selecting the perfect time to harvest is when that sugar level reaches the optimal amount that they like. Also, the acids need to respire so that they aren't too high. But in addition to that, we, it wasn't part of the question, but they're always looking for the flavor development. And if it's a red wine, they're always looking at the tannin in the seeds and also in the skins that get a sense for what they feel like. And that's something that is often more important than just measuring acid and sugar nowadays is that what we call that phenolic ripeness, where you get the flavors as well as the tannin development. Okay, great. So question number two is, according to the Napa Valley Vintners, what percent of wineries are moving forward with making wine? in this year, I should mention. This year, the harvest of 2020. And as you know, we've had a few challenges here in Napa Valley. We've had a couple of fires. Um, we've had a little bit of drought. It's been a, it's been a very challenging year. You know, We had a, a pretty bad fire back in 2017, but this year we got hit almost back to back with a couple of fires. So not everyone is going to be making wine. So is the percent of wineries that are moving forward, is it 20%, 40%, 60% or 80%. Okay. See the answers coming in. Uh, not everybody's getting this one the same answer. So there's quite a, a level of separating the, 
the A team from the B, C, and D team, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, A may not be the answer. I'm just, just joking. So a lot of people I see are coming up with C and D. It looks like from my end. How about you, Christian? Yeah, it looks looks like C and D pretty much uh, across the board. Yeah. Okay, and the music stopped. And the answer is it is D. Yes. So according to Napa Valley vendors, eighty percent of winers are moving forward, which is pretty remarkable. And now keep in mind. Uh, the Cabernet producers, that, that's a grape that typically is harvested a little bit later. We may not see too much of that, but there's certainly a wide variety of other varieties that are produced here, especially um, the white grapes like Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Pinot Noir, which is a little bit earlier ripening. Those varieties could still be made into some great wine here in the Napa Valley. And, and really our hearts go out to all of those people who have been affected by the fires, uh, you know, wineries, as well as the vineyard workers and people who live in the Napa Valley. All right, our third question of the day is, which of these grapes is traditionally the earliest to ripen? Is it A, Cabernet Sauvignon? Actually, we D, have a different question. We oh, have, sorry. Oh, yeah, oh, which oh, of the sorry. following statements is false? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I'm reading my list in the wrong order. I can't, <laughs> it's Monday, Monday. Okay, which of the following statements is false? Um, A, both machine and hand harvesting are often used to pick whole bunches. B, it is possible in the right climate to get two crops per year from grapevines. C, the Champagne Council sets a maximum yield annually for growers. And D, it can be more expensive to harvest on steep slopes because the grapes must often be hand picked. So which of those statements is not true? And somebody's calling in for the answer. <laughs> it's probably a robo call. I don't think I'll put them on. I'll just <laughs> hang them up right now. I didn't know if someone so was using the dial a friend option. Oh, it's probably someone telling me that I've got a rebate on my electrical bill or telling me that my taxes are due <laughs> or probably a political party asking me to support their cause. But more, nothing more important than harvest trivia. Okay, so we have answers coming in and we have um, A, C, B, hmm. some, uh, so a little bit across the, the board, no one choosing D yet. Huh? So yeah, A's and B's looks like okay. the, the predominant okay. choice. Well, we're starting to separate the answers a little bit. Shall we show them the final correct answer? Let's do it. The correct answer is A. Both machine and hand harvesting are often used to pick whole bunches. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about mechanical harvesting, but nowadays the machines are much better apt to pick up uh, grapes and, I'm, I'm sorry, that's false, uh, because you cannot get hand, you cannot pick up whole bunches with a machine. Not yet, they get, they are much better than they used to be, but if you want the whole bunch intact, it is definitely only achieved by harvesting by hand. Okay, now we'll move on to the question which I was reading just a little while ago. And that is, which of these grapes is traditionally the earliest to ripen? Is it A, Cabernet Sauvignon, B, Carmenere, C, Merlot, or D, Petit Verdot? Which of those is traditionally the earliest to ripen? And you'll probably notice that all of those grapes are the so-called Bordeaux varieties that you typically find uh, originating in the Bordeaux region of France. And Carmenere is a grape that is not planted there very much anymore. There's a little bit still left in Bordeaux, but obviously that's a grape that has made its home in Chile, in South America, making some amazing wines. In fact, they just had one the other day. And it was beautiful. When it gets nice and ripe, Carmenere has a beautiful sort of violet, a little bit of black currant leaf, just a little herbaceous character, lots of red fruits. It can be really, really fun to drink. Okay, so we have answers here. We have, uh, looks again, a, a split between D and, uh, and C uh, as mm -hmm. the answer. Some, some couple of choices for B and, and A as well. Okay, and the correct answer is, is indeed C, Merlot. Yeah, Merlot is always the earliest to ripen. It generally ripens approximately two weeks sooner than Cabernet Sauvignon and maybe uh, 
The same with Petit Verdot, which tends to be a really late harvest uh, variety, and then probably a week earlier than um, Carmenere. So Merlot is always an easy grape to grow in the sense that uh, it generally ripens very quickly, and that way you can hopefully harvest it before the, the rains come in, uh, particularly in places like Bordeaux, where it does rain quite a bit at harvest. You're, you've got some insurance that you'll be able to get something into your winery before uh, torrential rains hit. Okay, so our next question is about mechanical harvesting. Uh, which of the following is the name of a company that makes mechanical harvesters? Is it A, Masur, B, Mentis, C, Palanque, or D, Zamboni? So which of those is the correct name for a company that makes mechanical harvesters? This will be interesting to see where these answers fall. Okay. Some answers here coming in slowly. We have our first answer. And <laughs> no idea. Some okay, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to give you a little bit more time as the yeah. the answers come come through here. OK, maybe a little Someone says, not John Deere. Uh, well, you know, I thought John Deere would not make one, and I looked it up. They actually do make mechanical harvesters. So uh, there's somebody else in here that does it. But yeah, John Deere is, is a correct answer for somebody who does make one. <laughs> OK, now they're coming in. <laughs> now they're coming in. OK. I had fun with this one, because I actually made up a few answers here. Uh, and the correct answer is C, Palak. In fact, that machine you see there in the picture is made by Palaka. A, masseur is a, is a person who does massage. So in a way, mechanical harvesting is massaging <laughs> the grapes. Uh, B is actually a nonprofit organization here in Napa Valley that my wife works for. Uh, they do mental health advocate work. And D, the Zamboni is the ice machine that clears the ice uh, in between hockey periods. If you're a hockey fan, you would have known that was not the correct answer. <laughs> so, Great question. All these weird names, you never know what it could be. <laughs> All right, so go on to our next question, which is, which of the following terms would indicate the sweetest wine? Okay, so let's see. Would that be A, Auslesa, B, Petritus Scenaria, C, Essentia, or D, Bondage Tardif? So if you saw those on the label of a wine, which of those would indicate the wine would be the most sweet of all, all four wines? It's a good time to drink sweet wines as the weather starts to chill down a little bit. You know, a little warm. Oh yeah. Weather wine would be a you know a warm weather wine would be a rosé and whatnot. But now we're getting into the red wine and even sweet wine period of year. Okay, another so, another toughy question here. We have uh, uh, choices A, B, uh, C, and D with with a slight edge towards C. And C is correct. So Essencia is the name of the wine from Tokai, the sweet wine of Hungary. And Essencia is essentially the botrycized grapes that are harvested and they just squeeze whatever juice they can get out of these really dried up botrytis grapes. And then from that, they make a wine. Uh, it's made from pure botrytis juice, which is very, very little when you get those dried grapes. So it's extremely sweet. Uh, it's only made maybe a couple years out of a decade if they're lucky. Uh, the other options, Auslesa, yeah, that's a term for late picked in Germany, but they're not all necessarily that sweet. Uh, they can be medium, sort of medium sweet. Uh, Botrytis scenario obviously is the name of the mold that gives you the, the sweetness. And then finally, Vendage Tardif, meaning late picked, that term is used in Alsace. Doesn't necessarily mean the wine is sweet. It just means the grapes are picked a little bit later. In fact, the regulations for residuals sugar in that wine could be either dry wine or wine that's off dry or again, possibly medium sweet. But Essencia would be the sweetest. Okay, very good everyone. You're, for those of you getting these correct, these are not easy. So the next question does have to do more with botrytis. And that question is what aroma and flavor characteristics 
would botrycized grapes impart in a wine? Would it be A, dried apricot and honey, B, lemon and green apple, C, petrol and honey, or D, toffee and honey? So honey, you got a lot of options here. like people are starting to chime in with their answers. I can yeah. see a few coming in here with uh, the letter A so far it seems to be the most popular. Okay, and the music stopped and uh, uh, you're right, Peter. Looks like A is the, the favorite answer. A is correct. Yep, so the characteristics you would get with Botrytis grapes made into a wine would be dried apricot and honey. Other characteristics you might get, uh, some people liken it to a sort of a saffron-like character or marmalade is another one uh, but generally those are the um, it's a dried fruit character that you would get because you you are drying the grape out from the botrytis all right let's go on to our question that has to do with picking grapes at night so what is the main advantage to picking grapes at night is it a because it's better to ferment the grapes in the daytime b Cooler temperatures mean a higher chance of more structured tannins in the finished wine. C, it can minimize oxidation and therefore retain primary fruit characters of the grapes. Or it's because you get to use night vision goggles. Hmm. By the way, these are my new blue light glasses for computer light. But I think it'd be pretty cool to wear some night vision goggles. So which of those is the correct answer? Have you ever picked grapes at night, Christian? I have, yeah. It's uh, yeah. it's not not easy. Well, picking grapes at any time is not easy work. Yeah. Um, picking in the dark can can be have its own challenges too, or at night, not live, in the dark, obviously. And if you live uh, near a vineyard in Napa Valley, as many of us do, I'm not. I don't live right next door, but other people live next door to a vineyard. Picks at night. You've got the machines going by. You've got the bright lights. It's it can probably interfere with your sleep a little bit. <laughs> okay. okay. Ready for the answer? Yes. Correct answer is C. It can minimize oxidation and retain primary fruit characters of the grapes. In addition, when you bring the grapes in at night, their, their temperature is going to be much colder. And if you want to do, let's say, a cold soak, uh, particularly with your red grapes, it's good to already have that temperature to be on the cool side rather than warm. And for white wines, they off as the answer indicates really help to maintain um, the primary fruit aromas and also avoid oxidation. So now we're going to get into a little bit more of a science question, which has to do with acids in grapes. And the question is, which of the following acids is not found in grapes? Is it citric acid, lactic acid, malic acid, or tartaric acid? So which of those acids would not be found in grapes. By the way, I had a German Riesling last night that had tons of acidity. I don't know. I can't tell you which acid it was because it'll give it away, but boy, it was so good. It had a little bit of sweetness, but the acid was making that wine so bright and so refreshing. Okay, we have uh, locked in answers here. A's, B's, C's. So, um, and uh, yeah, and a, a, the A's, correct B's, answer, and C's. Correct answer is B, lactic acid is not found in grapes. So as you probably know, um, there's a thing called malolactic fermentation, which is converting malic acid into lactic acid. So that's how you get lactic acid in wine by converting the malic acid in the grapes into lactic acid. And that's done by bacteria. Uh, it's a separate uh, type of fermentation that's not associated with yeast fermenting sugar into alcohol. Uh, citric acid is one of the acids that's found in small amounts in grapes. And obviously if you, you get sort of a lemony taste from a wine, that's often due to the citric acid. 
And then tartaric acid, believe it or not, is the most prominent acid in grapes. It is uh, very stable. It also doesn't have any flavor, so you wouldn't know it was there by tasting. But it is interesting because tartaric acid is only found in grapes. It's not found in any other food or vegetable or fruit. In fact, the reason we were able to do um, studies that have proven that wine was made in Asia back in 5000 BC is that they found earthenware pots with some residual um, little, little compounds and they analyzed that those uh, dusty compounds and they found evidence of tartaric acid. So they know they were making wine in those vessels. And that's how we know wine has been around for, for eons. Okay, so let's go on to a little bit about harvesting grapes and where you might find those grapes. Uh, the question is, if you are harvesting Tanat grapes, where are you most likely to be? Would that be in Piedmonte in Italy, Santorini in Greece, Stellenbosch in South Africa, South Africa, or in Uruguay in South America? So which of those regions would be most likely to find you and the Tanat grape? Okay, they are very resolute in their answer on this one. I can see they are dominating with D. D is indeed the correct answer. Uh, so Tanat is sort of a, becoming a signature grape for uh, Uruguay wine. And it is also found in France in the region known as Maturin, which is uh, in the south southwest part of France. But it also is found a home in Uruguay, which is making some beautiful wines. Traditionally, Tanat is a grape that has incredible color. You can see the picture there with that deep purple color and really strong tannins. But in Uruguay, they've been able to make the wine with softer tannins and um, really delicious, soft and velvety, not what you would typically expect. So uh, let's do another grape. Um, this one would be actually a white grape. And if you were to be harvesting in Zolia grapes, uh, where would you most likely be? Would you be in the Barossa Valley in Australia, Mendoza in Argentina, Penedes in Spain, or Sicily in Italy? So if you're harvesting the Enzolia grape, where would you be found? I don't know where, where the answer might be, but I would love to be in any one of those places, right? <laughs> Okay, yeah, so we have um, folks who know their grape varieties, uh, it seems like, with D being the uh, predominant answer or the only answer given so far. That's, well, somebody, like you said, we got a bunch of smarty pants and they are indeed correct. This is in Sicily. So this is a white grape uh, found in the island of Sicily. Traditionally, this has been a grape that has been used to make the fortified Marsala wines that are famous from Sicily. but. More and more today, you see many of the grapes that have been used for Marsala to be made into dry table wines. And this is one of those grapes. So if you ever have a chance to try it, they make beautiful, nice, uh, slightly perfumed with some floral notes and really uh, pretty acidity as well. All right, Chris, uh, we'll go on to the next question then, which is, uh, which wine is most likely made from grapes that have underwent pastillage? So you kind of have to know what Pasillarage is. Is it A, Asti from Piedmonte, Asti, D-O-C-G? Is it a Cru Beaujolais? Is it an Oloroso Sherry? Or is it a Ruther Glen Muscat? So which of those grapes would most likely have been made from grapes that underwent Pasillarage? Or which of those wines, I should say, would have been made from Pasillarage grapes? Thank you. 
And how are the answers coming in, Christian? Oh, they're coming in slowly. So we have yeah, uh, two, two answers uh, so far, one for A and one for D. Go ahead and put your answers in if you, I will give you another couple of seconds here. Um, you have and, a 25% chance of being right. So. Yeah. <laughs> so we have another uh, another A coming in. So a little hesitance here to to answer this. Someone being honest and saying, okay. I have no idea. So. No idea, yeah. Well, let me tell you what Pastelarage is, and maybe that will give you a hint. It is actually drying grapes on the vine. So it's a wine made from grapes that have been dried on the vine. Okay. So we have someone putting in C. Now they're coming in. We have Bs, uh, As. Uh, A's and B's, so no one yet, uh, someone mm -hmm. with a D uh, question mark and Christian Van uh, Dyke put in a D as well. Whoops, and then I just removed the, the slide deck. <laughs> That's good. Well, the answer is D. Yeah, so Ruther Glen Muscat, and you can see some pictures there of the Ruther Glen Muscat grape. It's actually a Muscat grape, uh, it's a well-known Muscat a Petit Grand grape, but it's a red mutation. Um, and it gets shriveled up on the vine. And from that, they make a sweet wine, which can be really, oh, it's one of the sweetest, uh, highest residual sugar wines that you'll ever find. Uh, the other answers, just to let you know, um, Asti is made from muscat grapes as well, but it's they're not dried up. They want the wine to be nice and fresh and aromatic, lots of floral character uh, to make the really pretty Asti sparkling wine. Cru Beaujolais is made from the Gamay grape and Again, you don't want dried fruit flavors with that. And Oloroso Sherry made from the Palomino grape, but they pick that at sort of normal uh, ripeness and they don't dry those at all. They do dry the Pedro Menes grape in the Sherry region when they're gonna make uh, a sweet wine, often abbreviated PX for Pedro Menes. Okay then, well, let's go on to something maybe a little more technical. <laughs> Again, we're gonna see if the A team is really up to their knowledge day. So the question is, which of these compounds contributes the most to the color of red wine? Okay, is it acid aldehyde? Is it anthocyanins? Is it pyrazines? Or is it terpenes? So which of those contribute to the color of red wine? Acid aldehyde, anthocyanins, pyrazines, or terpenes? Indeed, that's a picture of red grapes that have just been crushed. You can see the seeds sort of floating in the top. Probably this is going on in many parts of the North, Northern Hemisphere right now as they're making their red wines before going into barrel or aging in a vat, perhaps. Okay, well, here we have, it's unanimous, so another DJ horn for <laughs> B. Um, and the Correct. Yeah, anthocyanins it is. So anthocyanins are those compounds that give you uh, the color. Also, that's where we um, also will obtain the tannin for red wines. Um, acetaldehyde is a compound that is, um, it's an actually a sign of oxidation. So it sort of has a nutty sort of bruised apple character. Uh, pyrazines are those characteristics that give you that real grassy, like uh, methoxypyrazine, if you're familiar with Sauvignon Blanc that can have grassy bell peppery notes. And terpenes are the characteristics you get in some of those aromatic varieties like um, Gewürztraminer and Muscat and Torrentes, those real intense perfume floral characters. Okay, so our next question then has to do with, you have to look at the picture carefully and answer where is this most likely to be? Is it Mosul, Germany? Parle, South Africa, Puglia in Italy, or Sonoma Valley in California. If you take a look at that picture, where would this most likely be? And again, I would love to be there wherever that is, in spite of a little cloud cover. Okay, yeah, less, we've got a few answers coming in, don't we? Yeah, less less uh, unity on this answer. Um, we have mm -hmm. A's, B's, D's, so all across the board. 
Okay. Well, here the correct answer is indeed A. This is the Mosul Valley in Germany. And actually, I actually cropped this picture because just to the left, you could actually see the river, and I didn't want to give anybody a clue off, but the Mosul River is right there. In fact, these very steep vineyards are planted right on the banks of the river, which help to do a couple of things. First of all, the river will help to moderate the temperatures, takes away the highs and lows, particularly in the wintertime when it gets really cold here. Um, the warmer air from the river will help prevent the vines from freezing. Also, the water provides the moisture that might be needed if you're wishing to make a wine from late harvest botrytis grapes, the so-called noble rot. And in addition, uh, the vineyards being so close to the water, the sunlight is reflected off of the water up into the vineyards to help further ripen those grapes. And you you might see a hillside like that in uh, South Africa, but the other thing that kind of clues gives you a clue it's Germany is that it is quite verdant, it's quite green here, whereas South Africa, Sonoma Valley, and Southern Italy, where Puglia is located, are much drier. Um, and indeed, it does rain even during the summertime in Germany, so you can see the, the greenish a topography, not just in the vineyards, but elsewhere. And that's Mosul. It's very steep. I'd hate to work that, that vineyard. It's obviously a vineyard that has to be harvested by hand. Okay, so another question, that has, this one has to do with um, which of the following training systems would most likely not be harvested by a machine? So of these different techniques or training systems, which of these would not be harvested by machine? Is it Gobelet, Scott Henry, Smart Dyson, or VSP? And VSP, by the way, stands for Vertical Shoot Positioning. So which of those would not most likely be harvested by a machine? And isn't, isn't C Smart Dyson, isn't that the new brand of uh, vacuum cleaner? Yeah, it's a Smart Dyson vacuum cleaner, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, my wife just bought one to clean up all the pet stains we had. <laughs> okay, so we have a couple of answers here. VSP, um, uh, other people choosing Goblet uh, as well. That's the predominant answer um, mm -hmm. with uh, also Smart Dyson, our favorite vacuum cleaner included in there as well. All right, well, the answer is indeed A. That's good. Uh, Goblet is correct. So Goblet is the so-called head trained. Uh, you can see in the picture there. It's head trained or it's a uh, bush vine as it's often known. And there's a, must be a wine delivery, the dog's barking. <laughs> um, but that is impossible as you can see in the picture. There's no way that a machine could get in there without destroying the arms on the vine. Whereas all of these other training techniques are positioned so that a machine can go through and shake the vine and jostle loose the grapes. So they're all in a vertical position, even not only vertical shoot positioning, but Scott Henry and the Smart Dyson. Okay, great. So we'll go on to a question about Marlborough, New Zealand. So in Marlborough, what is the biggest threat to successfully harvesting Sauvignon Blanc grapes? Would that threat be birds, frost, hail, or lack of labor? So which of those is the biggest threat to successful harvest of Sauvignon Blanc grapes in Marlborough? Answers slowly rolling in. First, we have our first two answers mm -hmm. with with D. Okay. So we'll give a, a couple of more seconds here. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Now are they popping in? Uh, we have A, C, B. So we're a little bit uh, all over uh, the 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 board. Good. Okay. Well, let's show them the answer then, Christian. The answer actually is birds. The birds love the grapes and frost. Not too much of a problem because this is really a maritime climate. You know, nowhere in New Zealand are you more than 75 miles from the ocean, and particularly Marlborough is like right on the ocean. So that ocean temperature will moderate the temperature overall, so you don't get frost damage. Um, hail is usually not a problem in 
in Marble, and it's particularly not at harvest time. They do have a lack of labor, but that doesn't prevent them from successfully harvesting grapes because they are using almost unanimously mechanically harvesting uh, those grapes. But it is birds, and you can see in the picture there's a couple ways they can deal with that. On the left, you see a cannon that will randomly shoot off a little explosion and you know scare the birds away. Uh, netting is another way, as you can see on the right, so that the birds cannot uh, get in to eat the grapes. But uh, I've, I've been there at harvest time. It was a, I was there in March one year where they typically harvest the Sauvignon Blanc grapes. And, you know, it was it was like being in a war zone because, you know, those cannons going off all the time just became very, very, um, well, became not only unsettling, but very annoying, if you will. Uh, so I prefer to see the netting more often than not. All righty, then uh, let's go on to a different uh, variety, talk about a grape that can give you a slight pinkish color. So according, uh, which of the following grapes turns pink? Pink is, it should be pinkish. Well, maybe pinkish isn't quite, pinkish is not quite as pinkish as it might be. And it went out of whatever. Which of the following grapes might turn pinkish when ready to harvest? And I did leave out the H, so I apologize for that. Is it A, Albarino, B, Chardonnay, C, Gewurztraminer, or D, Grunerveltliner? Which of those grapes might get a little pinkish color? And that's the, the grape we're speaking of is in that photograph right there. A little bit of everything here, huh? Yeah, but answers. a lot of a lot of people choosing C, your one of your favorite grape varieties. Okay. One of my favorite grape varieties, absolutely. And the answer is C, Gewurztraminer. In fact, when I first started becoming interested in wine, uh, you know, I was just a consumer who went crazy. And the first wine that I really fell in love with was Louis Martini Gewurztraminer. And from there, I tried all these different Gewurztraminers. But the one that I really remember that refers to this answer is Sebastiani Winery used to make a Gewurztraminer. They called it the Rosa Traminer. And they called it Rosa Traminer because of the color of the grapes turned that pinkish color when they picked it. And it actually was slightly rosé color. And this was this is even before, you know, Sutter Home White Zinfandel became famous. So, you know, really, I think Sebastiani, if they continue with that, may be even more famous than Sutter Home White Zin today. But that's another story. Okay, Got a, we have uh, three questions left, so here we are. Uh, this question has to do with the Tokalon Vineyard. Which white grape is the most widely planted grape in the Tokalon Vineyard? So Tokalon Vineyard, this famous vineyard in the Napa Valley, as you know, it's famous for uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and some other grapes, but of the whites, which is the most planted white grape? Is it Chardonnay? Is it Chenin Blanc? Is it Sauvignon Blanc? Or is it Semillon? Which of those is the most widely planted white grape in the Tokelon Vineyard? And for those of you who don't know where Tokelon is, it's right smack in the heart of Napa Valley in the Oakfield District. Andy Beckstoffer, as you can see, uh, owns about 90 acres. Um, Opus One owns about the same amount. Uh, Robert Mondavi Winery has about 430 acres. And there's also an experimental uh, station or vineyard there that is run by UC Davis and does a lot of great work in testing out different things uh, for growers uh, and helping to make them grow the best grapes possible. Okay. Well, a lot of people answering Chardonnay with some uh, mm. people uh, answering uh, Sauvignon Blanc uh, as well. Well, those folks who did Sauvignon Blanc, give yourself a pat on the back. It is indeed Sauvignon Blanc. And there's a picture of the Tokelon Vineyard and a particular part of Robert Mondavi's winery, or Robert Mondavi Winery's vineyard, which is called the Eye Block. And those vines that they have in Eye Block are Sauvignon Blanc vines that were planted in 1945. So if you can imagine, today they are 75 years old, which is, no, actually 85 years old. I can't even count that far back. Uh, they're 85 years old and they are still making amazing fruit. Not much fruit in that picture because it 
produces maybe less than a ton per acre, but those old vines produce some really intense concentrated fruit. In addition to iBlock with those old Sauvignon Blanc vines, there's other vineyards that Robert Mondavi Winery has uh, that goes into their Fumé Blanc. As you know, Robert Mondavi coined the term Fumé Blanc as a synonym for Sauvignon Blanc. And they still feel that it's a variety that does really well here in the Oakfield district. Just like in Bordeaux, where you find white wines being made from Sauvignon Blanc, along with the red Cabernet Sauvignon. All right, so hats off to those of you who got that correct. Okay, the next question is, in which country do they call vintage year Cosecca? Which of the countries call vintage year Cosecca? Is it Austria, Poland, Portugal, or Spain? Which of those countries use that term for vintage year? Okay, so <laughs> hey, somebody's giving away the polls. Yet. I you know I put that. I told Krishna before we went on here. I said, yeah, we're going to put in a question just for Monica's friends in Poland. Well, obviously, you know, there's it's not it's not uh, C. So, or sorry, not B. So you can choose one of the other three. You have a 33 percent chance. Well, the answer here is indeed Spain. Yeah, so the word coseca is vintage year in Spain. Uh, if we were in Portugal, it would be cojita in Portugal. In Austria, I'm not sure what they say in Austria, but um, maybe somebody can answer that in the chat box. Well, Christian, we've come down to the final question of the day. This is a hard one. So the question is, what wine will I be drinking in exactly 31 days? Is it A, Beaujolais Nouveau, B, Champagne, C, Late Harvest Zinfandel, or D, a vintage port from my birth year. So which of those would I be drinking in 31 days? Beaujolais Nouveau, Champagne, Late Harvest Zinfandel, or vintage port from my birth year? I guess not too many people think I'm going to be drinking vintage Portum from my birth year. <laughs> Probably because there's no wine that old left around anymore. All right. Well, yeah, people yeah. are choosing A here, so. Hey, it is indeed Beaujolais Nouveau Day, the fourth Thursday, I'm sorry, the third Thursday of the month. And indeed, that's what I will be drinking. I love Beaujolais Nouveau. You know, for me, it signifies uh, the beginning of a new vintage, a new year for grape harvesting. Wherever you are in the world, it's a great time of year to celebrate. And um, particularly since Beaujolais Nouveau is always released the Thursday before Thanksgiving, it's a great way to celebrate uh, Thanksgiving with. If you choose to serve something uh, to go with everything that you have on the table, Beaujolais Nouveau will stand up to it just beautifully. So that's it for my questions today, Christian. Yeah, great. This was great fun. And thanks so much, everyone, for playing uh, playing along and, and adding some context there with the Polish term for uh, for vintage. That was uh, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us from all around the, the globe. As a reminder, we have a study hall this Wednesday, 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time uh, on a WSET topic. So make sure and join us there if you're studying for the WSET. Otherwise, you can always join us back here every Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time for our trivia. In the meantime, uh, stay safe. Uh, drink well and be kind and we'll see you real soon. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.